We pick it up in chapter 2 and verse 1, and straight away we notice a date change. In verse 1, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. So we have a new prophecy here. And what we can pick up is that this day, the 21st day of the seventh month, was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So you can see on the screen that nice chart that we're familiar with. We may well have an insert of that in our Bible somewhere. And the Feast of Tabernacles there was on the 15th day and it went for seven days. So 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. We're on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this feast was designed to do a number of things. We'll go back to Leviticus in a minute. But you can see that it's at the end of all of the cropping and all of the primary industry for the whole year. So the first crops were the barley crops. We know that, don't we? They're in. And then all the other wheat and cereal crops, they're in. And then we go through all of the, the vine and the grape crops, the summer fruits it's got there, all of the olives, they're all in. Everything's in. The harvest is finished and the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated that. And this is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So why would Haggai appear on this day? So let's put a little thing in Haggai and chapter 2 and come back to Leviticus and chapter 23. We read there in Leviticus 23, and we'll pick it up in verse 39. On the 15th day of the seventh month, so that's the date on the screen, the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, note that, that's the point, not an arbitrary time. This is the point when all of the produce of the land has been gathered in. That's the marker point. You shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever through your generations. You shall celebrate it on the seventh month. Now look at this, verse 42. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths. There it is again. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am Yahweh your God. So the point of this is to remember there, humble origins so why did why did Haggai come on this day on the 21st day of the seventh month because they just emerged from seven days living in the humblest shabbiest dwellings made with tree branches they've been outside for seven days and Exodus says that everyone in Israel had to do this this is this is not for the men not for the elders, not, not for children. The entire Israel were outside in these booths, in these branches for seven days. And they come out on the seventh day and they emerge and there's Haggai and he's, here, he's back and he's about to speak to them. And their mind immediately goes back, yeah, our panelled houses aren't much use now, are they? Look where we've been for seven days. This is the reality of the Father's hand. This is where he wants us to be. All of those sealed houses have been empty and dormant. Locked the door, did whatever we do, shut the windows, draw the curtains, and we've been out there where God wants us to be for seven days. 
So that's the point of Haggai coming on this day. But there's another point. And the other point is that at this point of the year, it's at the end of their harvest. Everything was finished. Everything. So it's providing a contrast. Every storage, every silo, every hay shed, every storage facility, every fridge in the land at this point of the year would be chock-a-block. Everything's done. And some of us may appreciate the work of primary industries. It's, it's harder, isn't it, to have a, a check that comes in every week when you're on the land and you're dealing with crops. So you're relying on that end of year produce. When you got to the end of year, you gave thanks to God because he had given you a paycheck to get through the next year. You're about to go all, through, all the way through the rainy season. You needed that. And at this point, every container in the land was full. And our Lord Jesus Christ actually picks that up. Uh, if you'll come forward to John and chapter 6, John chapter 7 rather, Christ plays on this as well. Be wise to pick this up in the words of our Lord. John 7 is about the time when Christ went up to the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. And we read of that in John chapter 7 and verse 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So it was about to happen. In verse 10, after his brothers had gone up to the feast, i.e. of tabernacles, he also went up to the feast, not publicly, but in private. And then look what he says, look what happens in verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day. Now, to be fair, we don't really know whether the last day of the feast was the seventh day of the feast, because it was a seven-day feast, or whether it was the eighth day, which was the holy convocation. I don't think it really matters. At the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out and he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of my heart shall flow rivers of living water in abundance. That's the point of the Feast of Tabernacles. Every silo was full. Every storage facility was chock-a-block right to the top. And Christ stands up on that day and he says, if you're thirsty, come to me. I have got living waters in abundance. And no one will thirst. I can feed everyone for as much as they want. Christ did that specifically on that day, the great day of the feast. So that's why Haggai did it on that day, because every storage facility would be full. But of course, they weren't, were they? So Haggai's reminding them of their fortunes, their misfortunes. If we come back to Haggai in chapter one, we find that their storage facilities were anything but full. Haggai 1 and verse 6, that's sown much, you know, lots of grain in the ground, and harvested little. They ate, but they'd never had enough. They drank, but they never had their fuel. Christ says, you come to me, I'll give you living waters in abundance. These people were drinking and were still thirsty. He put on a garment and no one's warm. Chapter 2 and verse 16, we'll deal with this a little later in our exhortation. Chapter 2, verse 16, when you came to a heap of 20, you, you thought there were going to be 20, there's only 10 there. What's happening? When you came to a wine vat, you thought there were 50 measures in there, there were but 20. Israel was suffering and really, really struggling. And Haggai comes to them at a point where they've just come out of the most shabby construction that they had to live in, where they should have been celebrating the abundance of the land 
and the biggest paycheck of the year, and they've got nothing. So he's reminding them of their history, of their fortunes. You be stingy with God, he'll be stingy with you. And then what he does is he proceeds them to give a message, a message about the coming glory of God's house. The blessings of this life weren't there yet. They'd come in three months' time, but he's going to give them a promise of glory of the future age, not current blessings. Notice the priority. You'll get your current blessings if you do the right thing, but priority number one, you think about the future house first. Verse 2 of Haggai chapter 2. Speak now to, and remember the order, here's the same order, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, to all the remnants of the people, and say, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes? Now, have you picked up the tragedy in that verse? Remember the highlights of yesterday when we found that after all the cajoling and the pointing out, and Haggai saying, come on, consider your ways, have a think about your experiences, start your work again. The highlight was when they worked, they did start. They got together shoulder to shoulder. Zerubbabel, Joshua, all of the people, every single one of them, and they worked together. The highlight was they did it. And in verse 3, a mere 26 days later, people are complaining. They're not happy. They put a wet blanket on the work of the truth, the work of the ecclesia. Because there were those, says Haggai, who could look back on the former temple. What was that? Solomon's temple. In all of its glory. And they looked back at that and said, you know what? It's good that we're working together, but this new house, it's really poor. It's shabby. It's an embarrassment. And we liked the old one a lot more. And Ezra speaks of that, and it graphically portrays how there was this huge noise of shouting from the young and enthusiastic, and they said, we love this work. We love the working bee. We're doing stuff together. Go. And then there was this huge cry of sadness and tears from all the older people. And they said, we can remember the old one. And this is nothing. And the two cries drowned each other out, it says. Everyone was either happy or sad. It was a terrible time. And Haggai says, on the building site, there's some of you out there that are putting a wet blanket on the work of God. Because you can remember the old house. Now, to be fair, the old house was very, very special. When we look at the gold that was contributed to Solomon's house, we find that David himself collected gold from Ophir, the finest gold, the best gold. He laid up. Remember how we said that yesterday? A couple of brothers had a good chat about that after the supper last night. David made preparation, didn't sulk. I'm going to start to work for my son's temple. 3,000 talents of the finest gold from Ophir, David put together. And then others contributed. Solomon contributed 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams from the chief prince, uh, chiefs and the princes. Now, 10,000 drams is, is less than a talent. So it's sort of like saying 5,001 talents. 8,000 talents they put together. When we come down to Ezra, in Ezra chapter 2, the king Artaxerxes gave them 100 talents. And then all the people were only able to muster 61 drams. Bit of loose change. That's all they had. And you can do the math. Most of us can do the ratio there. The ratio is 8,000 talents of gold to 100 or 80 to 1. That's how impressive Solomon's temple was. It was gorgeous. 
It was amazing. Every wall inside was lined with gold. Do you get that? That is amazing. Every one kilo on this temple that these people are building was matched with 80 kilos in Solomon's. And no wonder these old men and old women, and bear in mind that Solomon's temple was destroyed 66 years ago. So these, these men and women, they might have been, I don't know, 15 or 20 back then. They're now, what are they, 80 or 90 years old? And they've got a memory of a tabernacle, a building, a temple that was destroyed 66 years ago. And they said, that was amazing. And this one is shoddy. And they cried. In verse 4 of Haggai 2, Haggai rallies them and he says, yet now be strong. Same list, same group, same titles. As is rubbable, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. Be strong, O ye people of the land, declares the Lord. Three times, be strong. Maybe another little colouring exercise. Do it. Be strong. Because he wants to remind them that this comparison is not a comparison that God had made. Notice in back in verse 3. Was it as nothing in your eyes? You saw it. How do you see it now? It's your eyes. This is not God's estimation, brothers and sisters. God wasn't looking back at Solomon's temple and saying, I don't like what you're doing. This is the people's estimation. Remember the work of Christ and he saw that widow come in and she had two mites. God didn't say, that's pathetic. Christ said, she have given of all that she has. It was their estimation, not God's. God loves our work. He loves our labours. And these people had put a wet blanket on the work of the truth. So God turns that around. He says, be strong. Don't you listen to this. Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, all you people. Don't you dare be put off. He encourage them strongly the word there for strong we can go to strongs if we want and it means to be courageous to be firm to be resolute Haggai is saying you resolve to do the right thing be resolute about this don't you be put off by that there's always going to be issues in the truth and stumbling blocks and problems they'll arise no shortage of wet blankets in this world but you be strong and you resolve to do the right thing. Even our Lord needed encouragement as well, didn't he, in the garden where it says that an angel of heaven encouraged and strengthened him. And if Christ needed it, so do we. Perhaps there's a lesson there, brothers and sisters, to be really careful about not living in the past. Past is the past. We would be absolutely foolish if we didn't learn from it. We would be absolutely foolish if we didn't value it. We didn't respect the traditions of those that have walked before us. But who's heard those, those words when I was a boy? You know, how big were the apples? How red were the apples? How great things were? I used to walk 25 kilometres to school. Rain, hail, shine. You guys don't know you're alive. It's, you know, it's, it's a bit of fun. Sadly, I'm at this sort of age now when, when I'm starting to think that way myself and I look back in my youth and think, yeah. But it's not super helpful when we make comparisons in the truth and we say back in the 50s, we did things really well. We had 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 interested friends every Sunday night. Don't lose that. Be inspired by it. But never put a wet blanket on the things that we are able to do today. We can't enjoy and maximise the present. What opportunities have we got today in 2022? 
It's not the 40s anymore, is it? We've got different challenges in all parts of life. We've got to maximize our challenges, learn from the past, lean on our brothers and sisters who have been there and fought the fight in the heat of the day and anticipate the future. There's a cool little quote from a gentleman called Alex Maley that some of you may know of. He says, you can learn much of your past, but the most important lesson is not to keep living there. And Zachariah says, don't you dare despise the day of small things. So I think there's a beautiful tension there, brothers and sisters. Only a fool would say that the past is of no value. Only a fool would ignore the works both written and the endeavours of our brothers Thomas, and Roberts and Carter and all of them. Only a fool would not go back to their works and quote from them and ignore all of their labours in the truth. But we can't just say they were the good days. We live in 2022 and we've got to do the best we can today. Learn from the past and prepare for the future. Now, in verse 6, brothers and sisters, we probably have a bombshell for the people on the building site. I feel a little sorry for them. Verse 6, thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while. And the King James Version doesn't do the best job of translating that. The ESV and all the newer versions say, yet once more in a little while. So see, just a little subtle change of words there. Yet once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Oh no, the temple's going to get destroyed again. There's going to be another battle. You thought you'd come back to the land and you can settle down and put your roots down and everything's going to be fine. No, no, sorry, says Haggai. You imagine getting that bombshell when you're partially way through a building project and Haggai come out and says, sorry, one day all of this is going to go again. This is not the end game, is it? This is not the end in itself. This is just part of the process. Verse 6, yet once more in a little while, I'll shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I'm going to shake all the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I'll fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of armies. So what we need to note here, brothers and sisters, is that there are three houses and they're all the same house. Did you notice that? So there was Solomon's house, which in verse 3, it says, is this house in her first glory? Same house, but just in a former glory, a former state. And then in verse 3, there's this house that they're working on right now. Same house, this house. And then in verse 7, it's going to fill th this house with glory. But it's not going to be that house because that house is going to be destroyed. It's going to be Ezekiel's temple, so to speak. But every single one of them is this house. Solomon's house is this house. Nehemiah's building and Ezra's building is this house. Ezekiel's temple in the future is this house. And the only thing that changes is the glory. So Solomon's temple had a, a typical glory, a former glory, a glory that pointed forward to the glories of the kingdom. Just a, just a little bit. It was typical. There was glory in that temple. The sad thing about Ezra's house, which was obviously extended later on to become Herod's temple, and the Jews mourned this, there was no glory at all. The Shekinah glory was not present. You could go into that temple. The high priest could go into the most holy place, and there was no glory at all. And the Jews mourned that. The, the glory had gone. And that's why Ezekiel speaks of, prophetically, the glory leaving the temple and then the glory returning back to the temple. 
because it came back, it will come back in the future with the excellent glory. And in verse 9 of chapter 2, it says, the glory, the latter glory of this house shall be greater. It's an important principle, brothers and sisters. One house in its former state in Solomon and its current state with Ezra and a future state with Ezekiel. One house, though. One house. But with different states of glory as we go through that. What I think is fundamentally important for us is that God allowed that house to be completely destroyed. You think about the enormity of that, brothers and sisters. Where did the plans of that house come from? They came from God. Who did God give them to? To David. Who did David give them to? To Solomon. Solomon gave them to his tradies. God specified that entire house. You go back to the first X chapters of First of Kings. You think about all the, the knops and the basins and the carved cherubims and all of the ornamental work that was laid into that temple at God's express command. Think of the 8,000 talents of gold that went into that structure. It was an incredible structure. And it's gone in a heartbeat. Gone. God said, no. And he allowed that to be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar came up and ripped it apart. And then this house that they were building on, the same. You know, Cyrus said, you go back to the land and build a house. God said, you go back and build a house. Haggai said, why aren't you building the house? God wanted a house built. He demanded, he required a house to be built. He wanted a place that they could serve. And Herod later come along and a whole lot of other people and extended the house and made it huge and very grand. And then Christ came along and said, one stone will not be left upon another in this house. It's gone. It's destroyed. What does that tell us? It tells us that God does not care at all for material things. The world's most special temple, and it's gone. The biggest extension in the days of Herod, it's gone. What does God want? He wants the people. He wants us. He wants our hearts and souls and when our hearts and our souls depart from the Father, then the temple of Solomon gets destroyed. When the hearts and souls of the Jewish people crucified the only begotten Son of God, that temple was ripped apart a few decades later. God doesn't care for this stuff. He cares for us. And that's why in the future age, with Ezekiel's temple in the kingdom of God, we'll have a house that will last forever and the glory will be excellent because it's going to be full of people who at last worship God in sincerity and in truth and the vast part of which will be immortal and reflect the glory of the father that's what God wants now there's another little lesson here just in passing that if God doesn't give two wits for the beauty of Solomon's temple, even though he specified it as such. You think about the glory of the future age. How good is it going to be? Solomon's temple was the best structure at the time and possibly sort of ever. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. No wonder those old men cried. You think about the beauty of the future life in the kingdom that we're going to be part of. You try and imagine it. God says that I can destroy because it's nothing. The future age is going to be amazing. Never lose perspective of that. Sometimes we look at this and our eyes have got blinkers on and we see cars and we see houses and we, we see things in this life. We don't open our blinkers up and think, God's kingdom is going to be 10 times this, 100 times this, 1,000 times what we've got now. Don't put roots down here because God's going to have to uproot them. The future age is the age to enjoy. 
And then Haggai goes on. He says, I'm going I'm to rip all this up. Verse 7, I'm going to shake the nations. The desire of all nations shall come in. It's a little note there. It's worthwhile making is that the verb shall come is actually a plural verb. So it's not desire, it's desires. The ESV and newer translations will say that. The ESV actually says the treasures of all nations. Sometimes when we see the desire of all nations, we see, well, that's got to be Christ. It's a bit nice, it's convenient, but no, it's not true. It's desires of the nations. It's Christ and the saints. We're there and we will come in and I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver's mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And certainly all silver and all gold will go up to that temple. But surely, given we're talking about glory in verse 7 and glory in verse 9, surely in verse 8, the silver and gold has got to have a bigger context of the redemptive work and the tried faith of all of those saints who assemble in that house. Verse 9 Note the language in the ESV and newer versions, the latter glory of this house. See the, see the change there? It's an important change to note. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And I, in this place, I will give peace. It's beautiful, isn't it? And that was Haggai's little encouragement to the people when the elders came out, those old men, old women, and they looked back and they said, the work of the truth in 2022 isn't quite where it needs to be. Now, I understand that the Salisbury Ecclesia might be embarking on a little building mission one day, hypothetically, who knows? I don't know. And if that happens, I wish you well, seriously, because I do have a little feeling that Building work, literal building work in the truth is good for ecclesias. You get shoulders together, you work together, you contribute together, you have a base, you have a home. I, I actually believe in that. But that's not the primary building of this life, is it? Primary building in this life is every single person on your role. Every single person, whether they're here or not. Clearly, our mission is to build a spiritual house. And the New Testament speaks of that. First Peter 2 talks about another sort of temple, a temple made of people being built as a dwelling place for God. And Ephesians 2 talks about a household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ being the himself being the chief cornerstone. And we are all fitly framed around that. That's our primary goal. When our arranging brethren come together, they're not as interested in the whole purchase. They're interested in the living stones of the ecclesia of God. How do we build our house? How are you going to build your house? I think an interesting point to start with there is to consider what the house is, to consider our legacy, to consider where we've come from, because we have a huge legacy in the ecclesia of God. You recall 1,500 years before Christ, in Exodus chapter 19, that Moses wrote, God said that we are a peculiar treasure. Israel was a peculiar treasure unto me above all people and holy nation. That's the ecclesia. That's God's ecclesia. And then to build on that, in Acts 7, it says, Stephen says that Moses was in the church, that the ecclesia is the Greek word, ecclesia, in the wilderness. Moses was in God's ecclesia, in the wilderness, having left Egypt. In Amos 3, those beautiful words that we know so well, you only have I known of all of the families of the earth. I've picked you out says God. You're my ecclesia. You're my family. In Acts 2, we come forward and the Jerusalem ecclesia was established. We know the circumstances there on that day. 
in 1 Corinthians 1, and I just love this quote here where Paul writes to the ecclesia of God, which is at Corinth, but he doesn't say full stop. He says, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, because Corinth wasn't the ecclesia. Corinth was part of the body. The ecclesia happened to be living in Corinth, where Paul was writing, but it's also in every place where people call on the name of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, in the 1800s, we had a revival of the truth as we know it today. The Birmingham Ecclesia was clearly the most prominent ecclesia at that time and in the modern history of the Christadelphian world. Had some 1,500 members at its peak. And then today, there's our ecclesias, the, there's the Salisbury group that meets. There's a Happy Valley group that meets. That's our legacy, brothers and sisters. Don't think that we're special in our hall, wherever we meet. Don't think that we're special. We are part of a, 50, a 25, sorry, 3,500 year legacy in the truth. God says, you are a peculiar treasure. And we're part of that today in 2022. So as an ecclesia, as part of the body, as part of all of that, having had our roots in the wilderness, having had our roots in Amos, we're part of that group that also met in Jerusalem and Corinth and Birmingham and now in Salisbury or a heritage college. We're part of that. We're not different. We're not a club. We don't have our own little rules and our own objectives and say, no, sorry, we stand for this, you stand for that. Here's a line, don't go here. We are part of that, every single one of us. It's not our ecclesia, except in the sense that we are very privileged to be part of this group in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't abuse or misuse ecclesia autonomy. So ecclesial autonomy is where the Salisbury Ecclesia can't lay down the rules for the Happy Valley Ecclesia. We all make our own separate decisions, but we can never, ever, ever abuse that, ever. We need to think of each other. We need to think of Moses in the wilderness. We need to think of Amos. We need to think of Peter in Acts 2, Paul as he wrote to Corinth. We need to think of our dead brothers and sisters who set up the Birmingham Ecclesia. That's our legacy. That's the things we belong to. And we need to respect every other brother and sister in our Lord Jesus Christ as we build up the truth. You can never say, I don't care about Ecclesia A or B or C because they're sons and daughters of God. The brother Harry Tennant, he wrote in a little booklet called Taking Heed to the Ecclesia of God. If, um, if you want a, a nice read, it's not long, but I don't know, it might be 25 pages long, it might be 30 pages long. It's a composition of four brothers. And they wrote about the workings of an ecclesia. Great title, Taking Heed to the Ecclesia of God. Brother Harry Tennant wrote this. We are members of a brotherhood. And we need to remember that we do not take decisions in glorious isolation. What beautiful words. We can never, I can never, you can never stand and say, well, this is what I'm going to do. We can never make decisions in glorious isolation. We have responsibilities to our ecclesias, our brethren elsewhere. Since we claim their fellowship and wish to exercise ours in their midst, to keep our own ecclesias strong, brothers, sisters, remember this, this is beautiful, to keep our own ecclesia strong and spiritually healthy is to contribute to the strength and well-being of the brotherhood as a whole. Every bit of effort you put into the Salisbury ecclesia has ramifications to the worldwide ecclesia of God. You have a strong group here, you're contributing to the strength of the worldwide ecclesia of God. I love that quote, Brother Harry Tennant, in a little book, Taking Heed to the Ecclesia of God. 
you haven't read that, young men, get a copy and have a look at it. So having contemplated our legacy, this is the, this is the building we're doing. This is the legacy we have. I'm going to put another challenge to you. And that is that if we're not actively building, we're actively pulling down. Is that reasonable? I think it is. If we're not actively building, let's just extend that out. You know, let's just say no one attends. No one contributes. No one supports. No one does anything. How long is that ecclesia going to last? Weeks, months, it's going to go. If we're not actively doing stuff, we are, by definition, pulling down. That ecclesia will not last. If we stop, if individuals stop, the ecclesia will not last. So all of us have an obligation, every single person, to either inspire or be an example or contribute and get stuff done in the ecclesia of God. What can we do? I make no apology, but the very, very biggest thing any of us can do is be there. Really be there all the time. Sunday morning, most of us get that. You have to be there. What about Sunday afternoons or Sunday nights? What about Wednesday nights? Why do our ecclesias only have 30%, 40% of our role on Wednesday nights? The biggest thing anyone can do from our older, dear brothers and sisters, and I can tell those who are older in this group that I love seeing brothers and sisters in their 70s, 80s, sometimes even more at my home ecclesia, and they're still there because there's nothing better to do on a Wednesday night. Nothing better to do. I get so inspired by that. And what about our young families? It's not easy. you got three kids, two kids, four kids. Some of us had more than that. It's not easy to get them all in a car. It's not easy to get them in a routine to get them to sleep. None of that's easy, but life's not easy. There is nothing better than to teach our little ones to be at the ecclesia on Wednesday night. And when we do that, the whole ecclesia looks around and you say, you know what? We all made a decision that there's nothing out there in that wicked, terrible world that would keep us away from a talk on the truth. This is our priority. And this is where we want to be. That's my challenge on Wednesday coming, to be there on the Wednesday night. That's the best thing we can do to build the ecclesia of God. Be there, have a good chat, encourage each other, put your arm around someone, talk to someone you haven't talked to for a while. That's why these camps are so great. I've had two days in this little area. It's been awesome. We need to take that back on Wednesday night. We need to be active. There's always things that we can do. And not just active, but do them to the best of our ability. You know, some of our people spend a lot of time contributing in the truth. Maybe a talk might take, I don't know, three or four hours to prepare. Maybe for some of our younger brothers, it might take five or six or seven or eight hours to prepare. I don't know. Do we spend that amount of time preparing for our chairmanships, brothers? Sisters, for our playing the piano? Have we spent four or five or six hours practicing to make playing and singing to Yahweh the best experience it can be? The reading of the word? That's a thing that we can do to make our ecclesia really blossom, contributing as best as we can, being active. Pick me. You want something done? I'm there. Pots? Maybe not. No, sorry, I didn't say that. Pick me. There's a vacancy in the program. I'll do that. Put your hand up, young brothers. Make your ecclesia really, really hum. We don't have as many widows and fatherless as we did in the first century when these words were written. 
but we do have them and you know that and I know that and these people are special and only an oaf would tread on them and ignore them and our Lord Jesus Christ loved every single one of them and we do have those in our ecclesias that take special care of those that need special care and that's a wonderful thing but never assume that never let it go never assume that someone else has got that in hand this is true discipleship to love our widows and our fatherless and then brothers and sisters i think it's important to to connect within our home ecclesia this is our family this is our family the family in the world we have social and spiritual obligations we need to have good bible reading habits so that when i come on wednesday this coming to the class whoever's speaking i would have done my daily reading that day and i can say brother x did you love verse three i thought verse three was great and sister y i managed to get the middle reading done today i'm making an extra effort did you like this you know that's why we call it a bible readings companion because it's it's our friend it's our companion we carry it wherever we go it's, it's probably in your bible cover right now and the beauty of that is that all of us did the same reading on the same day right throughout the entire world what an amazing thing to bring us together let's make a commitment to do that and share it i get thrilled when a brother at my bible class he's he's a legend i love him to bits young brother 30 something and he says, oh, I did this on Tuesday and I've been thinking this through. What do you think of this based on the Bible readings? You do that to a couple of the older brothers in this ecclesia and they'll think that's absolutely amazing. The integration we have, bringing families into our homes, supporting each other, good Bible study habits, doing some hard yards. Brothers wouldn't think twice of spending four Saturdays building a new retaining wall, would we? Would we be happy to spend four Saturdays preparing for an Opus Israel talk? That should be a joy. Do it for the Ecclesia, contribute to what we do. And never forget our inter-ecclesial responsibilities and obligations. The Salisbury Ecclesia is just but a name. It's an identifier. It's an ID of people that meet with you here. But we're just part of a huge legacy. What's going to happen at the next Prophecy Day in August this year? Amazing prophecies. You know, we said that on Friday night, Ezekiel 38 on steroids in the last two years, huge things happening. Come to the Prophecy Day. The combined weekend in October. What happens there? Is that a... Is that an opportunity to have a weekend off? Or is it an opportunity to build up and to go along and support and meet our inter-ecclesial obligations so that we're not blinkered to Salisbury or Happy Valley or Enfield or Golden Grove and we know that we're part of a three and a half thousand year legacy in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's building. And when our brothers and sisters and particularly maybe our ranching brethren get together, that's the stuff that's got to be on our agenda and right up the top. So I close with a couple of comments. Ah, beautiful quote from Proverbs. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Don't you love that? It's from one of the newer translations. You won't pick that up if you're uh, familiar just with the King James Version, but that's that's what it means. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Gorgeous. What you give, you're going to get back. You refresh others, you help others, you work for others, you contribute to others, you'll get it back. Work in the truth. I just want to leave this quote with you from our brother Harry Tennant, who I respect so highly. The little quote he gave, don't pitch your tent too far from the middle of the camp. Not in quotation marks, because I don't think he wrote it. I just know this quote from a number of people who heard it and have told me that quote. Don't pitch your tent too far from the middle of the camp. And for those of us who have heard him or knew him 
you know, you could see him, you could hear him saying those words of encouragement. When you set up your tent in the world, in the ecclesial world, you've got to be in the middle. You've got to come to Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesday night and you've got to, you've got to play ball. You've got to row the boat. You've got to row in unison. You have to be in the middle, says Brother Tennant. The ecclesial evidence is when you pitch a tent on the edge, you get eaten up. Just make a note of these two quotes. Numbers 11 verse 1, a whole lot of people complained and a fire from God came down and consumed the uttermost parts of the camp, the outlying parts of the camp. That's where the complaining was, Numbers 11 verse 1. Not in the middle, not next to the tabernacle, not in the Levites. The complaining was on the fringe. Don't pitch your tent far from the middle. Another one in Deuteronomy 25, a recollection of what the, Amal of the Amalekites did. Remember what Amalek did, says Moses, on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. Deuteronomy 25, 17 and 18. Who did Amalek kill off? The people at the back of the ecclesia who didn't want to be in the middle or the front or be part of it, or play ball, or row the boat. That's what suffered. Brother Harry, don't pitch your tent too far, right from the middle of the ecclesia. And perhaps we need to finish with a thought on our Lord himself. And we're indebted to Paul for those beautiful words that Christ gave himself for the ecclesia. Perhaps young brothers, especially, who are growing up in the work of the truth and being moving into formative roles in the ecclesia. What a motto in our life, to give yourself for your ecclesia. And we'll save for the Salisbury Ecclesia because that's where you need to. But for the ecclesia of God, the ecclesia of Christ, give yourself, yield yourself, give yourself up for the work of the ecclesia. But we don't limit that to our young men. We say our young sisters as well and our older brothers and sisters and our children. This is the future. This is the place where the glory of that, the latter glory of this house is forming right now. And we pray for that time to be soon. A couple of take-homes. Just bear in mind that when we're not building up, we are pulling down. Sometimes we get a bit stroppy, don't want to do this, I'll leave it to him or her. I'm a bit offended about that, I'm not going to Wednesday for four nights in a row. When we do that, we pull things down. We pull down the ecclesia of God. Don't live in the past, respect it, value it, learn from it, borrow from it, but don't live there. Prepare for the future. Whoever refreshes others, will be refreshed and finishing with our dear master as Christ gave himself, let us also give. Thank you.